everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you, guys. That was spectacular. Uh, my name's Braden Tierney. Um, I'm a PhD candidate here at Harvard Medical School, working on uh, mathematically modeling and then engineering host back to a bacterial relationships to better enhance human health. And today, I'm very excited to be talking to you about something that's near and dear to my heart. And that's the concept of microbes as the center, as the drivers of modern biotechnology. And so to give you context as to what I mean by that, let's start with the question. This is going to require moderate interaction with you guys. So I apologize, it's early, but let's wake up and, and do this. So which of the following cannot be made by microbes? And I want to see a raise of hands. Who thinks it's yogurt? OK. Antibiotics? Electricity. Perfume, <laughs> beer, or none of the above? None of the above, okay, great. So you're all, okay, I, don't, I can just shut up. You get the idea. Um, so basically all of these things, even electricity, which I was kind of hoping you guys would say, or perfume, uh, can all be generated in one form or another uh, by uh, different types of microbes. And so uh, I've had, I've been fortunate to work with bacteria specifically, but um, microbes brought in a broader sense um, over uh, in a number of different sort of environments, seeing how we can modify them to sort of enhance and help the human experience overall. And it's led me to the conclusion that if you want to understand tomorrow's technology today, you have to start with microbiology. And so that's where we're going to start today. And now, without further ado, um, I'm going to give you uh, four sort of components of this talk. The first is a brief introduction to microbiology, then three short vignettes about how microbes are being used in modern biotech today. So first, um, another question, true or false? Most microbes when ingested will make you sick. False. false. Great. Okay, if this were the case, then when my one-year-old nephew started eating dirt, it would be more of a problem. But it's not a problem. Uh, oh, this is also a good point to say. I am not a doctor. I am going to be Dr. Tierney someday, theoretically, but that is what I call an impractical doctor, if anyone's ever like um, being hurt on an airplane, and that I will not be helpful whatsoever. So with that said, I am not telling you to eat dirt, and anything else I say during this talk, like sometimes antibiotics can have bad effects, or maybe probiotics um, aren't always great for you, or maybe they just don't do anything at all. If your doctor tells you to take an antibiotic or a probiotic, for the love of God, please do. <laughs> Don't say some graduate student told me not to. That's not, that is, I'm not looking for any sort of lawsuit or anything like that. So I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm just talking about what's in the literature and what's in general scientific understanding. So um, I'm going to do the who, what, when, where, sort of how and why of microbes. Uh, so microbes sort of uh, broadly refer to microorganisms. Generally, those are understood as organisms that are too small to be seen with the naked eye, which is, if you think that's kind of a dumb definition, I agree. A lot of people have, there are some microbes that you can kind of see, some that are almost completely invisible, regardless of what you look with uh, at them. But, um, but no matter what, uh, that's kind of the general thing that's used in the field. And there are a bunch of different categories of microbes, so you probably are familiar with bacteria uh, versus fungi, which seem kind of similar, but they're actually evolutionarily very different. Um, and then viruses, which are totally distinct, and other sort of strange things that I don't fully understand, like protozoans, um, but that's way outside of my field, so we're not going to talk about them. The point is, what's really important from this slide is that um, when I, I'm not using the words bacteria and microbe interchangeably, microbe is a broader class of just sort of small things that contain bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Um, and so, um, on a more philosophical note, what is a microbe? A lot of people, which I, I suppose not you guys, because you said, you know, false, uh, think that microbes make you sick. They think pathogens, they think tuberculosis, they think these awful things. Microbiologists, again, think things that are too small to see. They look through a microscope. They might see an image like this of these little dots. Uh, these are what bacterial cells look like when they're stained in a particular way that makes them look purple here. Um, but then you think, okay, well, is this a single microbe or is this a group of microbes? This is actually a biofilm. You can see it with your naked eye, it's Canada albicans. And so what happens is you can have a single microbe continue to multiply and multiply and multiply until it sort of forms a community. And so these cells, which work and live together to survive in the world, are technically millions of microbial cells, but they kind of act like one. I mean, what are we? We're, what are, what are we, 30 trillion cells that make up a human body, all working together to do sort of one thing, and that's help you live. Um, and all of these microbes are working together to do one thing, and it's helped that biofilm live. So is that a single microbe, or is it just a bunch of microbes together? Who really knows? No one has an answer to this. If you figure it out, you get a Nobel Prize. That's great. But <laughs> the point is, it's a very vague definition. What I want you to think about for the purpose of this talk is that a microbe is a self-assembling machine. 
So when an engineer looks at a microbe, they say, man, microbes can do all these crazy things. And more importantly, they do most of the work engineering for us. They've already sort of evolved to exist in these states and they can sense and make compounds and work together. And so an engineer says, how can we take this machine that literally grows itself and tweak it slightly to make it do something else? And on that note, what can microbes actually do? So I love showing this image. Does anyone know what this picture is of? So it's dental plaque. Every single person in this room has a structure like this in your mouth right now. And this is where everyone gets up and goes to brush their teeth. But it's true. So every color, this has been stained. Um, it's, uh, and I'm sorry I don't have a scale bar on here, but it's very, very small. Um, and it's a couple hundred microns probably. And so you can see uh, every color represents a different microbial species. Um, and so they're working together and they grow in these remarkable patterns on your teeth. Um, and so I like this image because it really highlights every, a lot of different things that are going on here, really everything a microbe can do. They can sense, the purple guys can sense that the green guys are there and then cooperate with each other to form this structure. They can also compete. So the, the green guys don't want the purple guys to grow too much. They sort of might push them back and keep them within this biofilm. Um, they can also synthesize compounds. You'll see a lot of remarkable relationships where like the purple microbes will produce a molecule that the green microbes can't make. And so then the green microbes have that molecule and they can be happy and healthy and live, but they couldn't do it if they weren't next to the purple microbe in the first place. They can also kill each other. Um, we're really interested in this because when a microbe kills another microbe, they do it by producing something that stops life, otherwise known as an antibiotic. And so we're really interested in seeing how we can leverage natural antibiotic creation to actually create antibiotics that are good for treating our pathogens. Um, and of course they can evolve. Microbes divide and grow very quickly into these structures and as they're doing so mutations accumulate and suddenly they might take on another function. Again with a self-assembling machine imagine you have all the components of a car in your garage. You close your garage overnight, you open it, and then suddenly you have a car that's just assembled there the next day. And then evolution would be taking that car, putting it in a different garage, and then you close that garage, opens it, and because the garage is slightly different you have a Hummer the next day when you've had a Ford sedan before. And that is how I think of microbiology and it might explain why you know, I'm just a PhD student haven't actually graduated yet. <laughs> um, so last question we do, who, what, who, what, when, where, how, why? Where are microbes? So that is a large number. I'm pretty sure it's five in a million. I know it is five times 10 to the 30th microbes on Earth. So the answer to this question is everywhere. They're from the bottom of the ocean, living in these incredibly tough uh, sulfur vents or hydrothermal vents to, this is actually, has anyone seen this kind of picture before? If you've ever spent time in Arctic environments during sort of the spring or summer, you'll see when, when I first saw it, it was terrified. I thought, oh my God, something died here. It's watermelon snow. And so that's actually a type of microbe that lives on the snow in this incredibly harsh environment. You couldn't even imagine. I mean, at night, it's these frigid temperatures. And during the day, the sun heats up the top layer of the snow. It gets incredibly hot. But this thing can still live here. And so an engineer looks at that and it looks at all the things that a microbe can do and says, says, oh my God, all the work's done for me already. I can just be lazy and just make it, you know, do something else in a slightly different environment that is interesting to me. And so how exactly does that frame of work, uh, the mindset work? Well, an engineer says, I want to take technological challenges, feed them through the lens of microbiology and result in uh, microbially derived solutions. So what are some examples of these? We mentioned a few already. Beer is one of the most important microbially derived solutions in the world, in my opinion. Um, we're trying to figure out how we can use microbes to generate things like electricity, so build synthetic biofuels that can replace images like that up there. My favorite example of that um, is getting popular, has sort of gained some traction in the wastewater treatment called a microbial fuel cell, where you take basically a bunch of microbial sludge and it can basically work as a big battery and generate an electric charge. That is tetracycline, an antibiotic, which microbes can be used to produce. They can be used to enhance agriculture. And of course, they can be used to um, help treat uh, human diseases, we think. Uh, so on that note, we're now going to move to human microbial therapies relating to that last image. So um, fair warning. These are three very different vignettes. You might get a little bit of sort of intellectual whiplash. I always do, so I apologize. Um, but feel free to ask any questions afterwards and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, so first, human microbial therapies, you have to understand the human microbiome. Um, made famous probably by the Human Microbiome Project, which I think is probably about a decade old now. Um, the idea is we are a human ecosystem containing a microbial menagerie. 
uh, up to 100 trillion microbial cells inhabit your body. It's been estimated that's anywhere between three for every human cell to the lower estimates are about 30 trillion microbial cells, so one for every human cell. Um, but still, huge microbial load inside you. And it's been associated with um, immune health, so in the prevention of many diseases, the microbiome has been implicated in preventing, and in some cases, um, uh, not necessarily causing, but at least negatively associated with uh, diabetes and obesity, uh, Crohn's, colitis, um, of course, uh, like dental diseases like caries and periodontitis, oddly enough, rheumatoid arthritis, all these different illnesses that have been associated with the microbiome that are being, some of them being prevented, some of them being caused. So it's a really important area of study. And usually, I would say this is pretty safe to say, your microbiome helps you, but sometimes it could go out of kilter. Uh, this is called dysbiosis. And um, so the way this works is it can actually happen because of antibiotics. So dysbiosis can happen because of antibiotics. Again, not a doctor. Please take your antibiotics. But uh, just to show you, so here's you, right? And this is your colon, your gut microbiome. And normally you have anywhere between 100 and 200 species of bacteria in your gut. And so with these little colored circles represent different types of microbes. Everything's happy. You generally want a diverse gut to maintain your health. Um, but sometimes you might get like strep throat and you take a broad spectrum antibiotic. And that antibiotic can wipe out a lot of the native microbes inherently in your gut because they're not resistant to it, unless there's one little guy in there that might be resistant to it. And just like when I have a clean bedroom and I do laundry and I throw my clothes all over the floor and they just kind of expand everywhere, when you have a lot of microbial ecological space in your gut, if there's one microbe that isn't killed off by an antibiotic and just lives in there, it will expand in some cases um, if you can't replenish your natural gut flora quickly and take over. And this can make you very, very sick. An example of a microbe that does this is Clostridium difficile. Have any of you heard of C. diff? Okay, right? So it's a nasty illness. It's associated with a hospital-borne illness in many cases. They're very hard to kill, and so normal antibiotics generally don't kill them. And when they kill off everything else in your gut, C. diff can expand and take over. And so there's, well, this is a big problem. Um, and we, had to f we actually ended up finding a sort of microbially derived solution to this microbially derived problem. And that is one of my favorite things to talk to people about at 10.30 on a Saturday morning. It's a fecal microbiome transplant, uh, or an FMT, and that's exactly as uncomfortable and awful as you think it is. But it works. Um, and so, now, this is another thing where it's, so basically, you have your kind of bad poop inside you, and you find someone with good poop, and you put the good poop inside the person with bad poop, cured. We have no idea why, but it's how it works. <laughs> and so, seriously, and what I wanna really harp on here, and again, not a doctor, but this is the only clinically validated human probiotic that will alleviate disease. I mean the only one. And so what I'm getting at is if, if you like, I eat yogurt like every day, but, and you see on the bottom of yogurt, it's like if infused with lactobacillus or live cultures, that's great. That's really fine. It doesn't hurt you probably, but there's also no reason to, no scientifically backed clinically in a randomized controlled trial, validated reason to actually show that any of those things do anything good for you. The only example of taking a probiotic, which is a living organism that you would just to help your health actually cures a disease is a fecal microbiome transplant. Now, I'm not saying that you should do that and put feces in your yogurt. That is not what I'm saying in the slightest. If you have C. diff, talk to a doctor. It might be an option. Um, but in a quick, a quick uh, sort of timeline of FMTs. So uh, I like having this in here. Fourth century China is the first recorded FMT. I like to think about who was the person who thought that was a good idea at first. <laughs> I don't know who that was, but I want to meet him or her. 1958, first successful modern FMT. Another person I want to meet as to who thought that would be great to implement in a modern medical setting. Um, early 2000s, they gained popularity and sort of gained traction. And then, this is my favorite fact here, in 2013, stool was regulated as an experimental drug by the FDA. Um, so that's, if you take one thing away from my talk, I would be honored if you took away just that fact. <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, so about a 90% success rate with recurrency diff infections. Um, we have no idea why it works. We're trying to figure it out. Current work being done uh, involves customizing sort of the treatment to the individual, figuring out why it works, and designing orally administered treatments, which is much preferable to the alternative. Um, and so, uh, okay, so that's, that's one. That's one vignette. You have two more. Uh, so uh, second thing is microbial-driven agricultural engineering. Uh, so to understand this, you have to understand the plant and soil microbiomes, akin to how you have to understand the human microbiome for the former story. So this is an image of a plant root 
which I'm sorry it's a little washed out here, but these cyan dots on the root are bacteria that have colonized the root. So much like how we have uh, bacteria that live inside our body that help us, plants have bacteria that live inside their roots and around their roots that help them. A famous example of this is nitrogen fixation. So. Um, a lot of plants like legumes have uh, root nodules on their roots, and you can see that's what, there's an acorn for scale, that's what those little um, brown sort of balls are on the root. Those contain bacteria that take nitrogen and fix it into a state that the plant can then use, and that makes the plants really, really happy. But not all plants have naturally associated nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Like corn, one of our biggest cash crops, um, we have to pour tons of nitrogen-based fertilizer onto it to actually make it um, produce the yield we need. And nitrogen-based fertilizer is pretty bad for the environment when we're dumping it on. So a lot of bioengineers, are, actually I just read a story in the Uber over here this morning, um, Ginkgo Bioworks and Bayer announced a company a couple of months ago that now has a name um, based in Boston trying to engineer nitrogen fixation into a new type of microbe that we can apply in sort of optimal doses as a synthetic fertilizer to help fix nitrogen uh, fixation problems for corn. So that's a story that I think is, uh, that's going to be incredibly important if it works in the next decade or so. Um, another example, and again, I apologize for having a chart here. I hate it when scientists put charts in talks. Um, so if you just don't want to pay attention to that, just focus on the picture. It's much more interesting. But this chart over here um, is basically displaying another example of the beneficial effects of microbes on plants. Um, they, it's replicated from a study where basically all you need to understand is the light gray blue sort of bars there are just normal plants with no microbes on them. The treatment bars have plants with a particular type of bacteria on them. The treatment bars are bigger. That basically means the plant got bigger and heavier and was overall healthier when you put the microbes on it. These are called plant root growth promoters. Um, and so these, you can put these microbes on plants. The roots get longer, which can increase drought tolerance, and also they can increase yield in some cases. Uh, so a lot of people how can we engineer microbes that are going to increase yield and increase drought tolerance through experiments like this? Finally, um, a more concrete example. Um, this is an example of a strawberry that's been covered with a fungus. Uh, there are a lot of fungi, fungi that are uh, horrible uh, plant pests that when you, uh, they basically cause huge uh, cost losses, sorry, losses of money for the ag industry and loss of food for all of us, much more importantly. Um, and so there are a lot of, there's a lot of money being put into figuring out how you can derive microbial treatments to kill off pests using that natural competition we talked about. And so if you, there's this company that designed um, a, a sort of a natural treatment that allows you to put this microbe on the strawberry covered in fungus and the next day the fungus is gone. Um, and so it's just, again just an example of, and you can see this is not, this is the same strawberry, you can see little bits of fungus over here. Um, the microbes are incredibly powerful when it comes to sort of doing what they naturally do, and in this case it's fighting pests. Okay, that's two. Um, so, number three, this one's weird. Uh, weirder than the FMT, I swear. So this is, microbes is the future of data storage. So first, before we get into this, we have to say, who cares? Why is anyone doing this? Um, so what's the point? Again, going back to my one-year-old nephew, he's been around on this world for exactly one year. He's probably had 10,000 pictures taken of him and probably about 1,000 videos, and that's great. And you know, no one ever wants to have to delete any of those things. But you think about the rate of pictures being taken of everyone's one-year-old nephews. You think about, we're gonna run out of data storage soon. I mean, by 20, we have more data than we know what to do with. By 2020, we expect to have 44 trillion gigabytes of data online. My computer holds 500 gigabytes. I have no idea where we're going to put that. It feels to me like we're going to run out of silicon eventually. And so you have to basically figure out where are we going to store all this data that we want to be able to hold on to. You saw those pictures of those server farms. I mean, those things are huge. They take up huge amounts of space and use lots of electricity. So, people have thought, well, DNA, when you think about it, already encodes information. What information does it encode, you ask? Every fiber of your being, right? Because every, you basically are the result of the information encoded in your DNA. Um, and so the thought is, how can we translate sort of a DNA sequence to data information that we use? So what does that mean? Well, you have to understand a little bit about DNA. It consists of four nucleotides. We're just going to call them A, T, G, and C. Those are the four main molecules that make up it. You can think of them as just those letters for now, and different combinations of nucleotides can map in your bodies different types of proteins, which make you up, or um, in the mind of the bioengineer, different data structures. So what do we mean by data structure? You can think of like an image or a book, right? A book contains a bunch of data written in words. You could imagine
imagine how if you could think of a way to rewrite a language, rewrite the English language in terms of DNA, you could map every sentence in a book to a DNA sequence, and then you could sequence, you could synthesize that DNA sequence and then stick it in a tube. And every time you want to read your book, you sequence the DNA out, which we know is now low cost, and you can actually get your book back in front of you. Um, and how do we actually synthesize the uh, DNA sequences into a living organism? Um, and so people have been putting DNA into bacteria. That's the point of this vignette. Um, it's with CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. So you've already heard about gene editing. I'm not going to go into exactly what CRISPR is. You've probably heard of it. And I bet you if you haven't, you're going to hear about it in every talk today. Um, because it's one of the most exciting developments in the 21st century. The one thing I want you to take away about CRISPR, above all else, is where it was isolated from. Does anyone know where we got CRISPR? We didn't just make it up. Humans aren't that smart. Think about the top of the top of the talk. We're talking about microbes. Yogurt. Yogurt, yes. <laughs> Yogurt and microbes. CRISPR was a viral defense mechanism in bacteria. And someone found that and said, oh my god, this is really cool. And someone else then basically said, wow, this is really, really cool. We can use it to edit genes. That's basically the story of CRISPR right there in a nutshell. Um, and so we can use that to engineer um, uh, we can use that to engineer particular sequences of DNA into bacteria. Um, again, to really hammer home this data structure concept, uh, I want to just sort of show, to sort of, sort of visualize this. So on the left here, you have an image, right? It's just black and white blocks. You think about every image as a combination of pixels. Each pixel has a numerical value associated with it. In this case, it's just 0 or 1. 0 is black, 1 is white. Okay? And so you can see how the zeros map to the black box, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if you had a nucleotide sequence, um, ATGC or whatever, you could think about how, well, what if we make, all you need to do is encode position and its binary nature. So in the top left-hand corner, maybe top left-hand corner is AA, and then a zero is a G. So in the top left-hand corner is an AAG. We can synthesize that, um, or we can insert it into a microbe, and then you have your top left-hand corner of your image um, stored, and you can do that for every single block with different sort of combinations and meaning for the DNA, and suddenly you've stored your image. So people did this um, with an image of a hand recently, for whatever reason. Um, they basically were able to use CRISPR to engineer particular DNA sequences that coded different pixels and positions um, of, of this hand into a microbe. And what's cool is DNA is uh, really stable if you store it at cold temperatures. It can stick around forever. And it's really small. You could store you know, billions and billions, probably trillions of copies of this image in a single little test tube. And because, again, of the low cost of DNA sequencing, you can read that information back out. And as it gets lower, it'll be even cheaper to read it back out in the future. So people have all these ideas for like computers based in DNA, where you, all of your information is in a tiny little hard drive. It's a DNA hard drive. And you read it back out, and then suddenly you have more data than you can know what to do with. Uh, the question I want to ask is, what else can we store in that paper with the hand? They also stored an image of a horse galloping that I can't show you for copyright reasons, but you can imagine what a horse galloping looks like. That's kind of a, that's a public domain image of a horse. <laughs> um, I think the greatest crossover event in the history of mankind would be sort of storing the information in Avengers Infinity War in a tiny test tube and different bacteria. And of course, I have no doubt that probably within a year we're going to have some company that's like blockchain-based cryptocurrency stored in DNA or something. You know, like that. Because it's only a matter of time. But feasibly, you could put currency or information in DNA. I'm not sure why you'd want to, but I'm sure someone, someone does. Uh, anyway, OK. So without further ado, um, key takeaways. Bacteria are living machines. Um, they can carry out almost any imaginable task, and that makes the engineer's job really easy. You can be lazy and just tweak the task slightly. Um, recent tech microbially derived technologies have given us a greater degree of control over bacterial engineering than we ever thought possible. And um, again, most bacteria are good or neutral. So you can eat a little dirt, not a doctor, but you can eat a little dirt. Um, and OK, so uh, those are my image sources. Uh, I will now take, <laughs> take questions. Um, and uh, thank you guys so much for listening to me ramble. It's really a pleasure to talk to you. Using um, microbes, that's great. But I don't think we really understand everything that a lot of them do yet. That's so totally true. How are we? going to put in safeguards to make sure they're not doing something bad. Like taking the fungus out of the strawberry, but putting cyanide in it. Right, right. That is a spectacular point. Um, so. Oh, sorry. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Only you get to know the point. No. Um, OK. So, uh, so she's asking, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that 
my, we don't know everything microbes do, right? They can carry out these vast sort of uh, array of tasks. Um, and how do we know that when we put a microbe on a crop or something, it's not doing something bad, right? And so we have to make sure we're able to put in safeguards to prevent um, these bacteria or whatever they are from actually harming us or harming whatever they're trying to help in the long run. That's a spectacular question. There are tons of technologies being developed to sort of answer all aspects of it. Um, one of them, which kind of indirectly gets at what you're saying, is to a way to engineer microbes such that they can't survive out of the environment they're supposed to survive in. So a lot of people worry about contamination. Like if I put my microbe on my crop, what happens if it goes to a crop it's not supposed to be on? Um, and so people have basically, uh, well, one lab here at Harvard has worked on figuring out how you can engineer sort of synthetic uh, synthetic uh, nucleotide sequences that would never really occur anywhere else outside of a lab. So in it, we're making that microbe require something that can only be given to it in a lab. So if it gets out, it would die. I'm but Oh, right. The, yes. <laughs> that's honestly, Jurassic Park is where, that's the spectacular play. I, I, yes. Um, so uh, other, other way, basically, um, we most engineering is done in a few very sort of small model organisms that we understand perfectly well. So a lot of people are working to work on sort of natural isolate projects. Um, example, people are isolating yeast from wasps to make beer. The sort of, which is weird, but they are. The sort of approval process for that is incredibly long. It's basically like approving an FDA drug because you have to make sure the yeast doesn't produce anything that hurts people. But if you're making something in a lab strain of E. coli that people have worked with for the past 60 years, um, then there's basically, we, we, we do really know everything that that bug can do. Um, and so what the real engineering comes to seeing something that's interesting in one bug and figuring out how you can move it to a totally safe controlled bug that can't live outside of lab that is perfectly sort of, we know everything that's going on there. Um, so that's the kind of safeguard. If you want, we can talk more about it later. I'm sorry. But uh, that's, those are sort of the two safeguards that people are working with. Oh, you did mention like DNA data storage. Um, yeah. I don't know how much you know about it, but I'm just curious if you do know quite a bit. Like, when do you think would be like the most like feasible time that something would actually come out? Oh, um, that you could purchase. I mean, in my opinion, it's an economic question. What? Oh, great. Ah, sorry. <laughs> DNA data storage. When, uh, sort of, when in the future will it be actually feasible to do anything with it? Um, in my opinion, it totally depends on the cost of sequencing. Uh, so currently, I think it's cost prohibitive to actually store enough information in DNA to be able to read it out very quickly. That might change with nanopore sequencing, um, which is a sort of the next next generation of figuring out how we can read DNA. So I don't know what the time scale is going to be, but it, yeah, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a little while. Um, cool. Great. Okay. Thank you so much.